All right, I would like to record my notes, thoughts, and reflections on the second chapter of the first section of Bernd Heinrich's 2013 book called Life Everlasting. And Bernd Heinrich is a uh, probably my favorite naturalist writer. Um, I've read many of his books, and this one is divided into uh, different sections. It's about the relationship between life and death. And it was prompted by one of his friends um, requesting a green burial on Burns' um, land in northern Maine. In any case, um, the first section is called, I think it's small to large or something like this, and it's basically talking about um, the different sizes of um, scavengers that uh, feed on the dead and some of their natural history. And the chapter that I want to review right now um, is called Send Off for Deer. And um, this is a spoiler alert. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to resist going into whatever detail I need to go in to give the, uh, to make the notes that I want to make. So if you haven't read the book and you intend on reading the book and you don't want it to be spoiled for you, uh, then don't watch this. But if you want to compare notes or um, if you don't want to read the book and you just want to hear my thoughts on it, then let's trudge forward. Um, anyway, what this chapter uh, is about is his notes regarding um, what happens to various carcasses that he leaves out um, as kind of offerings slash experiments for the various scavengers um, who will disassemble the carcasses. And uh, the chapter begins with him leaving out, I think, a gray squirrel um, and seeing what happens in that case. And what occurs is that uh, I believe a raven um, comes by, checks it out, um, eventually pulls the eyes out of the squirrel, gets in his mouth, and uh, extracts a little bit of meat from there, as well as, as perhaps the brains, and uh, then goes on his way. That's all he's able to take out. He, you know, he rips some hunks of fur, but he's unable to actually open the animal. And this is a common um, issue uh, with, with uh, that I've noticed too, um, with dead animals, particularly like roadkill or like, for instance, the. Um, uh, the salmon die off after spawning. I saw this in uh, upstate Washington along uh, one of the rivers there, which is that you get all of these carcasses and the birds can uh, um, only realistically um, get at their eyes and, and some of the soft parts of the body. Um, it's interesting too in that even with larger animals, you see the same phenomena happen. It's the soft part of the bodies that the birds can uh, access uh, most easily. So uh, they end up ripping out the eyes, um, maybe tearing off the nipples, getting in uh, maybe the tongue, and certainly the genitals and uh, asshole and all of this. So it's those soft uh, holes that they're able to get in and get something out of. And of course, this is the same um, phenomena that, <laughs> that uh, the weirdo New Agers associate with uh, alien abduction of farm animals and such. They find a cow uh, with his asshole eaten out and its eyeballs gone and its, and its uh, nipples taken off. And right away it has to be a, uh, an alien that's doing this, but in in uh, reality, um, 
if they just use a little bit of common sense and thought about the natural world instead of jumping to this alien thing. It's like people that, uh, that jump to God as an explanation, you know? And personally, I think all of our answers to everything are in nature um, because this is reality. And so, um, so anyway, this raven comes along to the gray squirrel that Burned has left out and takes the soft parts that it can access. Um, then Burned goes out and cuts the squirrel open in hopes of bringing the raven back for more. Um, but what he gets at that point is a turkey vulture. Turkey vulture can obviously smell the squirrel, um, comes around, uh, stops and scopes out the area and preens for a while, then eventually goes to uh, eat what it can. It interestingly tears out the guts, um, throws those to the side, and then proceeds to eat the meat. And by the time it's gone, it has left um, the guts, the skin, and the bones, um, but it's eaten all the meat. Next come some crows. The crows um, take the, uh, the skin, go up in a tree and mess around with it. Um, eventually aren't able to get much off of it and so they leave it and Burn finds the skin turn inside out um, after the crows depart. So that's basically what happens with um, a small animal like a squirrel. Then he decides he's going to experiment with something bigger. So he finds a roadkill deer and um, recently, well fairly recently roadkill deer, although it's, I guess it's a little bit stinky. So he takes it out and um, uh, leaves it in the same area where he can actually watch in a forest clearing from his cabin window and see what happens. Um, and the roadkill deer is, and he, and he cuts it open, cuts it open, and the roadkill deer is visited by um, uh, turkey vultures and I believe uh, ravens, but um, they all turn their nose up at it, um, especially the turkey vultures. You know, they, they really take a look at it. Uh, I, I don't know, I might be off, I might be remembering wrong in terms of the ravens, but the turkey vultures give a, give a good look at it and they don't like what they see and they turn their nose up at it and uh, um, fly away. And um, so what ends up happening then are the much smaller scavengers arrive and here we're talking about um, blowflies in particular. Um, the blowflies come and start laying um, eggs on the uh, exposed meat and the life cycle of the blowfly is pretty quick. It's about eight days um, from start to finish. It takes about eight hours for the, for the eggs to hatch into maggots and uh, those maggots meet, reach maturity uh, within a couple of days and then you have them coming into becoming pupating into adult flies and then laying more eggs and such and so the, <clears throat> the and the blowflies love the bacteria um, so they don't mind uh, that the thing is bacteria filled and he goes on to talk about how um, when you have a larger carcass like a uh, a deer or a pig or a human or anything you know larger um, the, the body temperature of um, of the of the uh, carcass uh, takes a lot longer to cool down because it's large and since it's not rapidly cooling um, the warmth that is remain inside um, gives the bacteria a chance to uh, really go to town and so you know the first wave of uh, what happens with these larger carcasses is the bacteria uh, uh, reproduces um, very very fast and you know if you for instance come across a carcass like uh, for instance he, he um, at one time he was um, asked to be a witness in a court case uh, about a murder and to kind of get some evidence that he could use in the court case he took a pig and killed it 
left it out for two days to see what would happen and um, how quickly the core temperature changed and then um, once he had his measurements uh, that he needed for the trial then he um, carved up and started eating the pig and it turned out that the, the, it didn't taste right and it was because the bacteria had already spread in that two days um, because the carcass was slow to cool and so this is the way it is with the larger carcasses so if you come across something large and you plan on eating it you got to make sure that it was uh, very recently killed um, and of course if you're a hunter this is why you gut it right away um, to make sure that this bacteria does not spread and because because uh, most of the bacteria is going to be found in the most of the nasty bacteria is going to be found in the guts so um, so the bacteria is the first wave the blow flies or bot flies uh, will be the next wave and get their maggots on there eating the bacteria and then um, then you may have um, or you if if the bacteria isn't there then you may have some of the birds taking pieces um, when the bacteria is there it seems like the birds don't really like it too much after the flies come the beetles um, you have have the those uh, uh, what do they call uh, necro necro uh, something or other. It's like death loving beetles and basically the bur burying beetles um, that come and then begin to uh, scavenge off the animal and put their own larva in there and uh, feed them off of the carcass and eventually when you come down to like having basically uh, or and then there's coyotes will come eat off the carcass uh, uh, those kind of like dogs and then eventually uh, you're gonna end up with basically some, you know mostly skin and bone um, and then a deer might come and drag it off as was the case in a couple of instances where Burned had tried this experiment so there's kind of a sequence um, to the disassembly of those animals one thing that I found interesting was that he saw um, a porcupine had been gnawing on the bones um, after the insects had done their thing and I didn't know porcupines would would do that would gnaw on bones but it makes sense to me there are kind of like a uh, just a large rodent and the ro I know rodents do eat the bones um, he did make mention that really the the one bone that sticks around is or assemblage of bo bones is the skull and uh, certainly I've seen that myself come across far more skulls than any other kind of bone um, but anyway all of it is recycled back into the life system and so um, this is just an experiment that he did or a, or a number of experiments that he did leaving carcasses out and observing and watching what happens and again um, what I get from it in addition to kind of a little bit of learning about what that sequence is um, benefiting from his experiments is um, also uh, inspiration for how to go about learning because um, again his laboratory like I talked about in the first chapter is that natural world and he doesn't do uh, such intrusive studies he does things like this where in this case he was leaving out carcasses and just observes uh, what happens over the next few days as they're disassembled and you can learn a lot from that from that process um, I wouldn't mind at some point doing something like that here uh, to watch what the sequence is um, in my area in Alberta I don't suspect you'll be very much different from Maine but you never know um, so that was chapter two there's not a lot of uh, I don't have a lot of like critical um, thoughts to say about it um, however I think um, him opening up the carcasses um, though it might have uh, help to track some of the birds sooner I wonder what would happen also if he didn't open up the carcasses and um, you know that would be something to test as well
So that is his second chapter, the first section, and we'll move on, continue on through the book and see what else um, he presents and what can be learned from him.